Good morning, everyone. I'm Venkatesh, and I'll be talking about our work with generative adversarial neural networks to map the universe. We know that our universe is really big and it has a lot of structure. Starting with the Earth, which is about 10,000 kilometers in diameter, if you go up further four orders of magnitude, you reach the size of the Earth's orbit. About 100 times bigger is the size of our solar system, which has the planets revolving around the sun. The nearest star is about a thousand times farther away than that. And if you go up again three orders of magnitude, you reach the scale of galaxies that have a number of stars arranged in various patterns. Further still, you reach the scale of galaxy clusters that have galaxies arranged within them and about a thousand times bigger are superclusters that host galaxy clusters. Moving up further, you reach the scale of the visible universe. We would like to understand the formation and evolution of all these different structures at different scales. And we do that with n-body simulations. We first build theories of formation of these structures then starting with initial conditions and parameters, we evolve particles with known interactions. The next step is to test our theories with observations. On the one hand, we use telescopes both on ground and in space to obtain images of these objects. On the other hand, we use our simulations to produce simulated images. These images can't be compared with each other directly because we don't know the initial conditions for the formation of our universe. But we can compare features of these images, such as halo masses, power spectrum, etc. And this helps us constrain the parameters of our theory and even identify tension between theory and observations. Let's take one example of a structure, the largest structure, our universe. We know a lot about our universe. We know that it started with a big explosion called the Big Bang. Later on, there were various particle phase transitions. Eventually, stars and galaxies began to form. And all the while, the universe has been expanding with farther away galaxies receding even faster. We know that the universe is still currently expanding and accelerating. And Perlmutter and Rice received the Nobel Prize for their work on this. However, there are many things about the universe we don't quite understand. For example, there is evidence of mysterious matter called dark matter whose effect can be felt, but we don't know what that really is. There's also evidence for mysterious dark energy that is causing the expansion of our universe. All this is incorporated in the Lambda CDM model of cosmology. And currently this best explains our universe. This model has eight independent cosmological parameters. Our aim is to try and simulate the Lambda CDM model, and we do it in the following way. There are n-body simulation codes written, one of which is PyCola, and that's the one we use. To obtain simulated images, we start with certain initial conditions and cosmological parameters, and then run these simulations, which is an evolution in time, to obtain the final state images. And for our analysis, we only care about these final state images. Now, since these simulations are first principles methods, they're very time consuming. And as a result, running them at various parameter values is very difficult. To illustrate that, let's have a look at this two parameter space where on the y-axis, you have the Hubble parameter, which is a measure of how fast galaxies are receding from each other. And on the x-axis, we have the matter density omega m. In order to constrain these parameters, we would have to run the simulations along many points in this grid. The problem is, even running just a single point, if you want to obtain, say, 1,000 images, it takes about 10,000 CPU hours, which is a lot of compute time. So even in this case of just two parameters, it is quite difficult to constrain these parameters by running these n-body simulations. 
Now, our theory has many more parameters and in such a high dimensional space, this becomes practically impossible. So with n-body simulations, we have two problems. One is that the simulations are slow and as a result, even for the same point in parameter space, if we want to obtain a new set of images, we have to run it all over again and it takes a lot of time. Also, if we want to constrain parameters, we have to run them at various parameter values. And again, that takes a lot of time. The question is, can machine learning step in and somehow help us produce these images quickly? We know that neural networks are an important component of machine learning, and they are basically universal function approximators. They learn patterns in data. One of the most common type of model in machine learning is what is called a discriminative model, which learns patterns in input data and then makes predictions on it. So for example, you could train a discriminative model with images of tigers so that it learns the pattern. And then if you give it some other images, it can make a prediction of whether the image is that of a tiger or not. Another category of models in machine learning are what are called generative models, which learn patterns in an, in an input data sample and then can produce new data samples belonging to that type. For example, you can train a generative model with tiger images. And once it's trained for random noise vectors, it can produce new tiger images that it hasn't even seen before. In other words, the generative model learns the space of images. So in our case, we would like to train a generative model to produce images of that resemble simulated images obtained in cosmological simulations. One type of generative model is what is called a generative adversarial neural network or GAN. A GAN has two networks, a generator and a discriminator. The generator, as the name suggests, generates artificial images. The discriminator, on the other hand, discriminates between images and determines whether an image is real or artificial. To train the GAN, what one does is provide the discriminator with sets of real and fake images, and it's told which ones are real and which ones are fake. So it eventually learns to distinguish real images from fake images. Now this information is passed to the generator. So the generator learns how to produce images that resemble the real images, and as a result can fool the discriminator. If the GAN is trained properly, the generator eventually produces images that look very similar to real images, but are not identical. So in other words, eventually the generator learns the image space. Now training a neural network is time consuming, but the real power of a GAN is that once you train this network, you can just run the generator and produce new images very quickly. Now, one problem with a GAN is that because it has two self-competing networks, training a GAN is challenging. On the other hand, it's been found that among other generative models, GANs produce very sharp images. And as a result, they're very popular in a number of scientific problems. Even in cosmology, GANs have been used before. For example, Mustafa and all used GANs to generate 2D images that resemble simulation images from weak lensing. So what's new in this work? First, in this case, we are using a new data set and we are producing 3D images using GANs. Because 3D images have a higher memory requirement, we're having to distribute the model over multiple GPUs, and this is a challenge. Secondly, we're also using physics-informed losses in the GANs to help the GAN train much faster. So our first step is to 
train again with a set of cosmological parameters on smaller images. So we start with 64 cube images, where in these images, each pixel denotes the mass density of a small part of the universe. So here we have some preliminary results. To the left, you have eight images obtained from simulations. And to the right, you have eight different images obtained from the GAN. Now, these are 2D slices of 3D images. And if you compare them, you can see that they do have some common features. For example, regions uh, which have a higher mass density right here. However, just by comparing them, you can't really tell if uh, the GAN is doing a good job because unlike the actual images of like tigers, you can't really tell if they're matching well. So we need to compare summary statistics on these images to decide if the GAN is doing its job. So for that, we, here to the left, you have the pixel in intensity histogram. And the black curve here denotes the pixel intensities of the simulation images. And the blue markers denote pixel intensities of the images generated by the GAN. And as you can see, within uncertainties, they're matching really well. However, the pixel intensity histogram does not capture any distance information between the pixels. To get an idea of that, we have to use a different metric, such as the power spectrum. So here we compare the power spectrum of the GAN images, which have the blue marker values, with the black line, which corresponds to the spectrum of the simulation images. And as we can see, they match really well. So this tells us that the images produced by a GAN are indeed very similar to the simulation images, which is what we want. So we can use GANs to produce images of a certain type, and this is pretty useful. However, if we have multiple types of images, let's say tiger images and lion images, we could train a GAN for each case and we'll have to store all these different GANs. Or we could do something better. We could train what is called a conditional GAN, which is trained on different inputs and it's also given an input parameter. And after it's trained, if you give it an input parameter, it'll produce an image of that type. For example, it'll produce tiger images when you give it the input parameter of tiger. So in our case, we would like to implement this for our cosmology data set. So this is what we'd like to do. We train a conditional GAN with a set of input parameters. In this case, I've shown three parameters, omega m and h naught that we encountered before and sigma eight where sigma eight is the measure of deviation from uniform density in the early universe. And once we've trained the GAN correctly, we can give it input parameters and see if the images that it produces match those of simulation images. We could go even a step further. We could even give it intermediate values of these parameters that the GAN hasn't seen before and see whether it's producing good images. So we'd like to start small. We start by varying just one parameter, sigma eight. In this case, we give it three parameter values, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, and 1.1 for training. And after we've trained the model, we'll see how it, how it does when predicting an intermediate value of say 0.65. So for this case, since the conditional GAN is computationally more expensive, we tested it out for 2D images of size 128 square. To the left, you have the pixel intensity histogram for three values of sigma 8, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, and 1.1. And these are the training values that we used. And as you can see, these markers, which denote the images produced by the GAN, match the black lines, which denote the pixel intensities for the simulation images. So this tells us that the GAN is doing well with the values it was given during training. Now, the next step is to make a prediction at an intermediate value, in this case, 0.65. So here you have three different 
conditional GAN models that are predicting images at 0.65. And as you can see, they match really well with the black line, which corresponds to the simulation images. So what this is telling us is that these conditional GAN models are learning the image space well, and they are able to produce accurate images at intermediate values. Now, this is great because now we can use the conditional GAN and explore a much larger region in parameter space. Moving on, our next steps are, we would like to develop the GAN for larger images in 3D, moving from 64 cube to as large as 512 cube. And this would involve us trying to scale this model over multiple GPU nodes. As far as the conditional GAN is concerned, now that we know it works well for a single parameter, we would like to make the conditional GAN take in two or three parameters and produce images. And this will help us explore a much larger region in parameter space. Now, there are many people who are concerned about using results from machine learning models. And that is a valid concern because especially in models like what we're using, generative models that produce images, how can we really be sure if the images are correct? So in our case, we are not using machine learning to replace simulations. The machine learning part is used to explore a region of parameter space. And then at the important points, we can rerun the simulation to make sure that our results are as we expect. So this is our actual workflow that we hope to use. So we start with n-body simulations on a fairly sparse grid in parameter space, and we use that to obtain our training data. This is used to train the conditional GAN. Now with the conditional GAN, we can run on a much finer parameter space to obtain images which can then be analyzed to identify the important points in parameter space. At these select few points, we can now run the n-body simulation to check and ensure that our generated images were correct. Now here is a table comparing the time taken for various parts of this workflow. And as I mentioned before, for the simulation part, it takes about 10,000 CPU hours just to get 1,000 images. The GAN training part is also fairly computationally expensive. It takes about 100 GPU hours. But the real benefit is in the GAN generation, which takes of the order of minutes. This is what will enable us to explore a significant part in the parameter space and get images really quickly. I'd like to summarize. I've shown that we're able to develop GAN models that can produce images that resemble the simulation images. We've also developed conditional GANs that can generate images at interpolated values of the parameters. And these can be used to significantly speed up scientific analysis and save compute time. And this is necessary to keep up with the rising telescope data. Now this method is quite general and applicable to other simulations as well. So we can develop GANs to study galaxy formation and any other scientific problem that involves n-body simulations. I'd like to thank my collaborators at Berkeley Lab and Lawrence Livermore Lab. This work is part of the Exalearn Initiative, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project. Thank you for listening.